Welcome to the teaching ministry of Bay Ridge Christian Church. This teaching is from the series Mission Possible. As Christians, we are called to be on mission, longing and working to see God known and worshipped by people from every culture, from our own city to the ends of the earth. Our uh, text today is going to be Romans chapter 10, verses 14 and 15. Uh, this is going to be the last teaching in the Mission Possible series. Uh, calling it The Call of Mission, How You Can Be Involved. So I'm hoping to be very practical today. We're really going to be tying a lot of things together that we've been focusing on all fall. Romans chapter 10, verses 14 and 15. The verses, as always, will be up here on the screen. You can follow along here or in your Bible. Hear now the word of the living God. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. When uh, I was a young Marine down at Quantico uh, at the basic school, everybody had to learn whatever you were going to do in the Marine Corps, you had to learn the basics of being an infantry officer. And one of the things they taught us, one of the first things, was what they called the five-paragraph order. This is the way Marines pass on the mission because if you are a platoon commander, which is what most of the lieutenants who would go into the infantry, for example, were going to be doing, you would have to take an order that might have started all the way up to the battalion level saying we're going to be doing this big thing and get all the way down to what your platoon's going to do. And in fact, your squad leaders then, your corporals and sergeants would go off and have to explain it to their group. And the five paragraph order was how you took the big picture and you kept passing it on and breaking it down for your specific unit so that at the, by the time they got all the way down at the end, the Lance Corporal who was standing there knew what he was responsible to do. Kind of how it fit in the big picture, but what his real responsibility was. Because as a Lance Corporal, that's what his concern was. How do I do what I'm going to do? Well, this fall, we've been looking at God's global mission, the big picture of what God is doing in the earth. Today, I want to kind of do a five-paragraph order and bring it down to us and say, what does that mean for you and me? What does that mean for those of us who live here in the Annapolis area this time um, in human history? How do we get involved in God's global mission? So that's what we're really going to talk today. Today, in essence, you're going to see is going to be very brief and then mainly applying the word because this is kind of like, if you want to think about it, applying the word for the whole series. What does it mean for us? So let's talk again, remind ourselves of the mission. And I've mentioned this several times. There's, there's basically three groups of people who are involved in the mission that Paul tells us about here in this text. The first group is those who need to hear, those who are lost. Paul tells us in, in Romans 10, 14, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And so Paul tells us very simply, you cannot call on Jesus for salvation if you haven't even heard of who Jesus is. And he says you, you can't believe in him or you can't call on him if you don't believe in him. And you can't believe in him if you haven't heard who he is. And so people who do not know God cannot become part of God's people without someone sharing the gospel with them. This is the methodology that God has chosen to employ. And this is true both locally and it's true globally. Coming to faith requires someone verbally sharing the gospel. Someone telling us of Christ's life, his death, his resurrection for us so that we can be saved. There is no other way to come to faith. One is not a Christian culturally or by family. There must be conscious agreement with the gospel, and there has to be active trust in Christ. That's what it means to be a Christian. Many people today are wringing our hands quite a bit here in America over the growth of what is being referred to as the nuns, people who, who say, I'm not part of any faith. But can I go ahead and tell you they are nuns because they really were nuns all along. 
They considered themselves Christians, many of these folks, but they had no active trust in Christ. They did not understand nor really believe the gospel nor really trust in Christ. They considered themselves Christians because culturally that's what they were. But the scripture knows nothing of that. And so in a certain sense, I, I'm almost glad because it makes it easier to help them understand, well, now you understand you're not a believer. Before we had to first convince them they weren't believers to convince them to become believers. Now they already admit that they're not believers. So there is no such thing as I'm just kind of, I'm an American or I was raised in this family and that makes me Christian. No, a Christian is one who has heard and believes the gospel, who is sensed to its truthfulness and who actively trusts in Jesus Christ. And so this is the first group of people, and there are literally billions of them on the planet. This is not an endangered species. There are millions of them living within a few miles of where we are right now. There are hundreds of thousands of them in Anne Arundel County, just this county. There are hundreds of thousands who do not believe the gospel of Christ, and therefore there must be mission, because how can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how are they going to believe unless someone speaks the gospel to them? That's the first group of people. Second group of people uh, relative to the mission are those who preach to them. And this is the believer on mission. Paul continues in verse 14 and says, And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? These people can only hear if a fellow human shares the gospel with them. A fellow human being must share the gospel with them. God sometimes prepares the way by visions or dreams or angelic visions. But ultimately, the gospel spreads as believers on mission reach out to the lost. If you think in the scripture, you can see, remember Cornelius had a vision, but he did not come to faith in Christ until Peter went to him and preached the gospel. When Paul had a vision of Christ and was knocked off the horse, Ananias still had to go to him and preach the gospel. And so it is today. God may prepare the way by other means, but ultimately it's you and me verbally speaking the truth of the gospel to others that allows them to believe and call out on Jesus Christ. To come to faith, the word of the gospel has to be proclaimed verbally. And that means it's not enough that we do good works. We must proclaim the good news. Now, why I say this is, in Romans 10, 17, in the same passage, Paul puts it this way, and I'm using the ESV here because it was a little closer to the Greek. It says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Faith comes, notice, not from seeing, but from hearing. Not from seeing good works being done, as important as those are. And I've spoken of the need. Part of the mission is us doing good works. But nowhere does the Scripture say they will see your good works and then they will believe. That's not what happens. What happens is they hear the gospel and that stirs faith in their heart. And so there must be the proclamation which... Paul here refers to as the word of Christ. To hear the gospel, believers have to share with them. And so good works that we are part of and call to support are a powerful testimony to support our verbal speaking of the gospel, but they can never replace it. Faith comes from hearing the good news, not from seeing good works. Now there are some Christians, and I, I stress this point because there are some today who want to say, well, you know, I, I do my preaching by my life. No, you don't. You may support your preaching by your life, but preaching is verbal proclamation, and no amount of good works can replace that. There have to be those who preach. How will they call on the one they believe? Unless someone preaches to them. And the answer is they cannot and they will not. It does not matter how much other good works we do, there must be a proclamation of the gospel. And that leads to the third group that Paul tells us, is that there's those who are sent to, and those, there, those who are sent, there are those who send. And so he says in verse 15, and how can they preach unless they are sent? Now, 
the first thing that Paul wants to drive to here, and this is really important, is God is the one who sends on mission. And what we've been seeing in this entire series is our God is a missionary God. Our God is a global God. He is a God of mission. He is a God who from the beginning of time has been reaching out and calling out to the nations from the call to Abraham where he said, I'm going to bless the nations through you. And Paul tells us that is primarily about the gospel. God is a God on mission. And therefore, he is sending his people on mission. God's people are sent with the good news that our God reigns over all. Notice Paul goes on there and says how beautiful on the are the feet of those who bring good news. And he's quoting from Isaiah, and the good news they bring is our God reigns. That we come with the message to tell people that God reigns over all. And make no mistake, it is good news you and I are sent with. The news that Christ has conquered death is very good news. In fact, there is no better news. God reigns over all. When you look at the world and it seems to be a mess, the proclamation that God rules and reigns over all things is very good news. And Christians are called to do this. But Christians are also called to support them who uh, support those who give themselves to the, the proclamation of the good news vocationally. In other words, who in here is sent on mission? All of us. But all of us are also called to support some who, for their vocation, are proclaiming the good news, whether locally or especially cross-culturally. And so we not only are all sent on mission in a certain sense, but what Paul's also talking about here, because he's talking about his apostolic mission, there are also those who supported Paul. They were on mission locally, but they supported those who were going cross-culturally. They supported those who gave their full time to the work of proclaiming the gospel. And so it includes supporting the mission from here to the ends of the earth. And that's the three parts that there are. You're either lost and being sent to, you are one who is going, and we're going to see that even when you are one who goes, you are also supporting others who go into areas where you yourself can't reach. That's the call for all of us. Okay, so let's, let's take our order down. That's, I've come back from God, and he's given the five-paragraph order. I'm now down, and we're, we're in our fire team here at Bay Ridge Christian Church. How do we apply this? What does it mean for you and me? Well, there's basically three things. Number one, we're called to join the mission as a radical sender. All Christians are called to support God's global mission. And I want to emphasize the word, this is not lukewarm support. This is not, well, you know, once a year for a week we think about God's global mission. No, this is being a radical sender. Now, if we're going to be radical senders, and the word radical means it goes to the root. That's what it it originally meant. It goes to the root. It goes to the core of who we are. So if we're going to be radical centers, those who from the core of our being are involved in God's global mission, what do we do? Well, there are basically three aspects I would highlight for us. Number one, we need to learn about what God is doing so we can be part of sending and what's going on. And so I encourage you, every month we do Missionary of the Month. Colleen comes up here, she educates us some, and we pray. Or sometimes she has like this month, she had Melissa come up a couple of times. But there's education going on here, and we are learning. You can learn more by going to the website. And don't, well, I'll do it later. No, every month, go out there and read. Learn what they're doing so that you can pray with specificity for the group that we are praying for that month. I encourage you. I saw Dick Dykeman was handing out today Persecution Magazine. That's one of our missionaries we support, International Christian Concern. And ICC puts out a magazine that lets you understand about the persecuted church, which is we've seen most often where the gospel is most effectively spreading at that moment, there is usually persecution. And so the two go hand in hand. So as you read Persecution Magazine, you're finding out what God is doing. I just saw yesterday, and I don't even uh, know if if, uh, Tim and Tanya know this, a few years ago, uh, be, through a relationship that Tanya Muma had, we had a woman, Grasha Burnham, come here and speak. If you remember, she and her husband were kidnapped in the Philippines years ago. They just announced, and this came out yesterday, that some of the kidnappers have become believers now. They've actually responded to 
the gospel of Christ. And they had a quote from Grasha saying how grateful she was that God had worked that way through all of that, even though her husband had died in the rescue attempt trying to get them. But God is at work. So I encourage you, get a hold of it. Learn what's going on in the persecuted church. We're going to have a great opportunity. It's been in the bridge, but there's a great class called Perspectives on the World Christian Movement. It formed the heart of the missions class I took at seminary. It's going to be here in Annapolis in 2017. It's going to be hosted at Bay Area uh, Church over on the outskirts of Annapolis, and there's going to be information in the bridge coming up. It is a challenging course to go through, but I encourage you, it will it will help you understand what God is doing. It will fire you up for the mission. If you want to be engaged in God's global mission, the first part is understanding what's going on. You, you can't engage in battle if you have no idea where the enemy's at, where you're at, what you're trying to protect or what you're trying to, to attack and take. Or you, you can't be part of the battle. So first off, learn. Secondly, we pray for God's global mission. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 6, you remember he's going over the armor of God and spiritual warfare, and he concludes it this way in verses 18 to 20. It says, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert, and always keep on praying for all the saints. You know how many times there he's using all and always? Because Paul assumes this is radical. It's going to the core of who you are. Verse 19 and 20, pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. So notice there, Paul's assuming we're praying for God's mission. We're praying for saints around the world. We're praying for those who are reaching out in, uh, with the good news. We are praying for those who are specifically reaching out across culture. We're praying for those who are persecuted and locked up. All of that's right here in just these couple of verses. And Paul says, pray that the gospel would go forth. Friends, that is what our call is. We are called to battle praying. But too often, the reason the American church is not engaged in God's global mission is our prayers, like the rest of our life, are narcissistic. It's about me. It's about what's going on in my little world. Now, God is interested in you and your little world, and he's interested in me and my little world, and I'm grateful for that. But he's also interested in his global mission. He is interested that there are billions who are perishing without the gospel. And if that is not a core concern in my prayer life, my prayers are too small. And then we wonder why, to be honest, Prayer gets very boring then. Little prayers make for boring prayer. It just does. John Piper, I'm going to read a quote here. This is from his book on missions called Let the Nations Be Glad, that if you want to learn more about missions, I highly recommend this book as well. He said this about prayer. Life is war. That's not all it is, but it is always that. Our weakness in prayer is owing largely to our neglect of this truth. Prayer is primarily a wartime walkie-talkie for the mission of the church as it advances against the powers of darkness and unbelief. It's not surprising that prayer malfunctions when we try to make it a domestic intercom to call upstairs for more comforts in the den. Those are convicting words. Do my prayers sound like wartime communication, or do they sound more like can I get some more hot cocoa brought down to the den? Because if that's what my prayers sound like, that's pretty boring. I can go get my own hot cocoa. But if I'm praying for God's worldwide mission, for the powers of darkness to be broken, for it to be pushed back around the world, that's something that is worth praying for. And so I encourage you to pray as spiritual warfare for the mission every day. Not just when we gather on Sundays, but every day praying for the mission. When the news comes on, I can't stress this enough, we need to be the ones who are praying. As you see millions of Muslim refugees flooding into Europe, are we praying that they would hear the gospel? 
Are we praying that God would use this moment as we see some other country you may not have even heard of before? I remember when I first started learning to pray for the mission, I, I had prayed through an Operation World, this book where you go through every country, and I prayed for this little country named the Maldive Islands. I had never heard of them before. But they were one of the places that there were no known believers. And it was the 1980s, and suddenly an American plane, a P-3 Orion, had to do an emergency landing in the Maldive Islands. And it came on, and all everybody in America was concerned about was, how are we going to get a mob, blah, blah, blah. Well, there was one person in America who was concerned about something else. I was praying every day, oh, Jesus. I have no idea how or why, but I am praying there's a believer on that plane, and I am praying somehow the gospel gets to this little remote place where there are no known believers. Is that the way we think through the news? Because if it's not, we're not being radical sundry. We're just reacting like everyone else does. We need to pray as spiritual warfare every single day. If that's not how we're praying, I want to urge you, get fired up, pay attention. We're going to be moving on to a different series. This mission doesn't stop. We need to pray every day for God's global mission. The last aspect of how we can be radical senders is sacrificial giving for God's global mission. Sacrificial giving. Please pay attention all day long to the adjectives. I will try to stress them, but they are very important. Not just giving, sacrificial giving for God's global mission. Matthew 6, 19 to 21. I'm glad Jesus said these words, not me. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, for where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Our heart follows our treasure. Notice that that's not my words. That's Jesus's words. I can know where my heart is by looking where my treasure is. And Jesus says, if your treasure, if you're storing it up down here, and you're storing it on yourself, and he goes on, and he's very clear, because in the next couple of verses, he says, here's the treasure I'm talking about is your money. What are you doing with your money? You can't serve two gods, he says. You're either going to love the one and hate the other, be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And so Jesus says, if you want to know where your heart is, look where your money goes. Period. I'm really glad I'm not the one who said that. Really glad that's not, quote, Brett Hicks, but rather Jesus Christ. Your treasure shows always where your heart is. Look at your checkbook. That's where your heart is. It's that simple, according to Jesus. Do I view my finances primarily as a way to support God's mission? Now this, boy, you want to talk countercultural. That is not how we think of it here in America. We are more like the character, I must tear down and build bigger barns. And what did Jesus say to that guy in the parable? You fool. You fool. Your life's going to be required of you tonight, and then what's going to happen to all of this stuff that you've built up? Where my treasure is invested reveals where my heart lies. The two are always linked according to Jesus. And so, we need to not only pray radically and consistently, we need to give consistently and sacrificially for God's global mission. One of the reasons we do this in the church, and we've been engaged and trying to give and support, and we've been doing this the, the whole time, ever since I became an elder, that was the first thing I asked, as God is my witness. First thing I asked when I became an elder in the church, and they said, would you like to be the pastor? And I looked at the finances, and I said, well, one thing is for sure, we are truly nonprofit. That describes this church well. So I'm going to have to keep working my job, but we set about right then saying we were going to give 10% to missions because we were going to be serious about God's global mission. And that has always defined this congregation. It will always define this congregation 
but it needs to define us personally as well. And there is a God. God is good. God cares for us, and he cares for us as his people. But let me tell you, to give sacrificially means there are things we do without. Our neighbor has something that we don't get to have because I am more concerned that someone else gets to hear the gospel than I am about this other thing. And if we are really going to be radical senders, that's what's required. Now, the next way we can do it, that's being a radical sender. Knowing, praying, giving. We also are to join the mission as a radical goer. Some Christians are sent on mission globally. I've asked this several times, and I'm going to continue asking it. Have you asked? Have you considered? Has God sent you on cross-cultural mission? It may be that God calls someone sitting in here right now to go on cross-cultural mission. Missionaries, you know, are not strange peoples who grew up in, you know, God grew them up by some alternative process. Okay, they, they, they aren't test tube people or people plucked off a tree or anything like that. They're just you and me. That's all they are. And they hear a call from God that says, I'm calling you to go to another mission. Don't assume it's someone else. It might be you. You may be sitting here as I'm saying that and saying, well, it might have been me 20 years ago. No, it might be you in retirement. You could pick up, go to China, teach English as a second language, be involved and engaged in that way. You could support the mission some other way. God may send you, and there is no time or place that puts us outside of the possibility of that call. Abraham, I remind you, was not a young man when he was called by God. And in fact, his life in many ways was just beginning because God was at work. Are we being called to go on mission globally? But there's a second part of that, and that is even if you say, I have prayed and I do not believe that, you are still sent on mission locally. We don't just support others. We ourselves are part of the mission. Every one of us are called to be part of a local church on mission. There's so many verses on this, I'm not going to run them all up here, but the New Testament knows nothing of individual Christians who are not part of a local church that is engaged in mission. It just There's no concept of that anywhere in the Scripture. If you read Acts 2, 36 to 47, the day that the Holy Spirit falls and Peter preaches and proclaims, everybody who believes is baptized and they are joined to the church and they become part of a church community. And we see the whole community of the church on mission, each individual person being part of that. If you read 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, Paul goes all over spiritual gifts. And the doctrine of spiritual gifts is not to create conflict between charismatics and non-charismatics. It's God saying, I've brought you all together because everybody's part of the mission. Everybody's got a gift to be part of mission. So all of us are called to use our gifts and also to serve to meet needs. And that means when, even when we gather on Sunday mornings, for example, there are people who are called and gifted to be part of the worship team, to be part of the prayer team, to be greeters, children's ministry, lead and host small groups. All of these are part of the church being on mission. There are people that serve in jail ministry. For us, winter relief, serving down at the county fair. All of these things are part of us being on mission. I could keep adding things to that, but everybody is called to be a part. We, uh, matter of fact, we're also going to have even a short-term mission trip coming up in 2017. We're we're still working on exactly how that's going to go. I want to encourage you to consider going and being part of that. Here's the one role nobody has. Consumer. That, that's not part of the team. Bench warmer. Not part of the team. That's not what God's calling us to do. Every one of us are called to be on mission and to be part. If God's called you to be part of Bay Ridge, he's calling you to be part of Bay Ridge on mission. And that means all of us are engaged in that. It's that simple. And it's not hard to do because if you are a believer, you have been gifted by God to be part of the mission. The other area where we do this, however, is 
all of us are called to personally reach out to the lost locally, every last one of us. 1 Peter 3.15, Peter is speaking and he says, but in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. Now notice here, apparently the lifestyle is prompting questions. This is where good works can come in, but it has to be completed, Peter says, by as you are living your life and you start engaging in conversation and the question arises about who you are and what you believe, notice what Peter does not say is find somebody else who can complete the deal. Trust that somebody else will share the gospel. Who's supposed to talk to them? Me, the, the person right there. We give them the answer for the reason for the hope that we have. We are called to share the gospel with those around us. A simple way to be able to do this is there's friends you've been praying for, you've been reaching out to. During Advent, the whole month, we're going to be focusing on the gospel. If you don't know anything else to do, just invite them to come to church with you one, one Sunday morning. Most surveys, believe it or not, Americans think that everybody's going to get upset. What I imagine in my mind is if I ask my neighbor or my friend to come to church, they're going to scream and holler at me and throw something at me. In reality, survey after survey says that most of them say, I'd like it if somebody asked me to go. I'd consider going. And the worst they can do is say, no, I don't, don't ever ask me that again. And, and you and I will survive that. The people in Peter's letter that he's writing to were actually being really persecuted for reaching out with the gospel. It's a simple thing. Invite somebody in here for heaven. Invite somebody to Christmas Eve. They're going to hear the gospel. Some Christians get upset with, you know, with C&E Christmas. They show up Christmas and Easter. I pray our tribe of that increases. Because if you're going to show up a couple of times a year, please come here because I know you're going to hear the gospel. It's what we're going to focus on. We're not going to get into something else. We're going to talk about who Jesus is and what he did. It's a great place to invite someone. Um, we're actually this spring, another way to learn... We're going to have training coming in here. Somebody we met uh, at the bridge conference that ICC did is going to come in and do some training on reaching out to Muslims. In March 17 and 18, this is a young woman whose father actually was an assassin for the PLO. And then he became a believer because those kind of things happen, just like they did with the Apostle Paul. And his daughter actually became a radical Muslim for a while at that point because she was not happy with her dad for converting to Christianity. But she's now converted. She's going to be here doing some training for a couple of days about how we can reach out to Muslims with the good news of Jesus Christ. And we're going to be trying to partner with some other churches on that. It's a great way. And folks, we have lots of my next door neighbor, Muhammad. The first time I met Muhammad, we went out there, we shook hands. I was gauging that they were probably from India I, by their clothes. I was correct, but then he told me his name was Muhammad. And so I've spent the last two years praying for Muhammad and every chance I get running out to engage in conversation with Muhammad, trying to reach out to him, trying to pray. And look, now it requires sensitivity. I didn't walk out the next time I saw him and hand him a track because that's not going to work with the Muslim. Okay? And we, we talked and I asked him questions. They said, be very, very patient. It usually takes years but we want to learn how to reach out. There are folks that God has brought here. I'm looking and saying, there's a reason Muhammad moved next door to me, and I want to reach out to that family and be on mission with them. I encourage you, the, the last part is, keep your eyes open. There are opportunities every day. The good news, here's a piece of good news. You don't have to go to remote India or Africa to find lost people you probably can just open your front door. I'm willing to bet with every one of you, unless you live in Parvilla probably, every one of you have unbelieving neighbors, okay? You, you've got them. Like I said, I've got a Muslim living next door to me. You never know. When I was down at a church conference, I've mentioned once before, I was using Uber, and a young woman's picture popped up as going to be my cab driver, and being as brilliant as I am, I saw all the Muslim headdress and all, I thought, oh my gosh, I have a young Muslim woman going to be my cab driver. So immediately, I didn't say I'm going to check the scores. I started praying, Jesus, here's a chance. Sure enough, she's from Saudi Arabia. Is there any chance for me to go to Saudi Arabia as a missionary? No. 
but she was here. And so we got in the car, and we talked the whole way to the airport. First time ever I was hoping the airport ride was slow and that we were going to get there and it was going to take longer to get there because of traffic. And we got to share the gospel, and she actually was very close to responding to the gospel. At the end of it, she let us pray for her. That's just having your eyes open. Just a picture pops up on my phone and says, this is who my cab driver is. Every one of you have those opportunities all the time. So do I. Let's ask God, look, be excited. We're on mission. Not someone else. You're a missionary. So am I. So are all these folks we pray for up here. They're just doing it cross-culturally. We're doing it right here in our own country. Now, the last thing is that there are those who are completely missing the mission. That's the, the last thing we can do. We can completely not join the mission. That's called being a consumer Christian. Because if I don't join as a radical sender and a radical goer, I am being radically disobedient. There is, and, and it's radically. It means to the core of my being, I am saying, God, you're on mission. You're a missionary God. You're at work. You've been doing this for millennia. You have saved me. You have given me the Holy Spirit. You have gifted me. You have taught me. You have spoken to me. And you have sent me on mission. And I've said, I'd rather not be part of that. That's what that is. Every Christian is called to be on mission. And what this is, and it is a particular problem in America. Here, I'm going to teach a series one day on, on modern myths. We, we don't understand the word myth. The, the word myth originally meant the practices and rituals and beliefs that shaped you. It had nothing to do with whether it was true or not. It just meant it was the stories and practices and things that shaped you. Here's one of the huge modern myths. You are a consumer. That's what you're made for. A consumer. That is not what you were made for, friends. You're made in the image of God. God's a maker. God's one who's on mission. He's not a consumer. He's a producer. But we have been told, you are going to go participate in a liturgy all week long when you walk out those doors. This culture is going to tell you a thousand ways every day. Be a consumer. Be a consumer. It's all about consuming. And then we come in here on Sunday, and guess what I've been shaped to be all week long? A consumer. And we want to approach our faith the same way. But we're not created to be consumers we uh, were not created just to say, I want to come and receive. We are created to come and say, I'm going to receive, but I'm going to give, and I'm going to be part of the mission. And what consuming does is when we are consumers, it says, I've got I to grab as much as I can right now and get it for myself and hold on to it. But I'm going to remind you, these are not my words again. There's one who said, for whoever wants to save his life, will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will actually find it. Life, real life, is not found in doing this. It's found in doing this. It's not found in gathering to myself. It's found in giving away. I've mentioned this before many times, but there's two seas in Israel, both fed by the Jordan River, one is the Sea of Galilee, and what's the other one? The Dead Sea. What's the only difference? Same river. The Sea of Galilee has thousands of species of fish and aquatic life. You remember Jesus and them used to fish there all the time. Why do we never read about Jesus and the disciples fishing in the Dead Sea? Because why is it the Dead Sea? Y'all are some smart people. The Dead Sea because it's dead. And why is it dead? Nothing's going out. This is where consumer Christianity ends. You take, and you take, and you take, and you take, and nothing goes out, and you slowly 
die. Because you were not made a consumer. You were made in the image of the missionary God. And so, friends, don't buy into that lie. Don't be shaped to that. Life is not found in holding it to myself. Life is found in giving it away. Life is found not in focusing on me and my problems, but looking out and reaching out and serving other people. That's where it is. Join the mission and watch life flourish. Let grace and mercy and blessing come to you and pass it on and watch life flourish. My deep, deep, prayer for every one of us. I want you to have the abundant life that Jesus said he came to give you. I want that for you. That is not found in consuming. It is found in being a channel. It is found in giving. It is found on mission. And on that day, it's going to be good to be around the throne and say, life was good, life flourished, life is blessed, and now I am in the presence of God, and it's even better than it's ever been. And Jesus is saying, well done, good and faithful servant. You flourished because you were on mission, and now enter the joy of your Lord, eternally enjoy the fruit of the mission on which I sent. Amen? That's what we're called to do. What we're going to do is we're going to stand together and we're going to conclude this series by prayer and we're going to do a radical prayer for mission and our part and i want to encourage you be asking god let god work in your heart right now as you're crying out and let this be a beginning prayer a beginning prayer of many prayers this week for god and his mission father how grateful I am that you are a missionary God. Father, how grateful I am that in a world of gods who are so parochial and tribal and and contained, Lord, you are the God who has made all things and you are the God who has been reaching out. You are calling for the peoples to praise you. And Father, I thank you that you are a God who calls us to yourself and calls us into the mission with you. Father, you have mighty angels to do your bidding. I stand amazed that one who has Gabriel and Michael at your beck and call would look at a speck of dust like me and say that you want me to be part of your mission. Father, I pray that you would burn that into our hearts and that, Lord, we would see, we would lift up our eyes and we would see the great mission which you are on. Father, I pray that you would burden every one of us in this room with the more than 4 billion people right now who do not know the gospel. Father, I pray that you would burden our hearts every day for places that are dark, where they are fighting against the gospel. And God, we may not be able to go to Saudi Arabia, but we can pray that you would bring down those walls. Father, we may not be able to go to Iran or Iraq, but we can pray that you would bring down those walls. God, I pray that you would pierce the darkness. Father, I pray that places where the gospel has not flourished, that God, you would raise up those who are believers, that you would send in those who are willing to pay the price, and that, God, you would fasten it to our hearts, that we would support them, that we would pray for them, that we would give to and for them. Father, I pray for the precious people who do not know you, Father, Muslims and Hindus, atheists and Buddhists, Father, those who in one form or another are simply trusting in their own works to save them. God, I do not judge them. Lord, I was just like they are. And it was your mercy and your kindness and your grace that raised this wretched sinner from death. Father, I pray that you would have compassion on them. Pity the nations, O oh our God, 
constrain them to come in. Father, I pray that the gospel would prosper. Father, I pray for us. Lord, I pray we would not give in to the gods of this culture. I pray, O oh Lord, we would not buy the lie that we were made to consume trinkets. I pray we would not buy the lie that we were made for stuff. God, I pray that you, by your mercy, would keep fastened to our heart what we were truly made for, to know and love and worship you, to join you on mission, to, to find the joy of speaking to others and see you working through us, to see others have their eyes open to the gospel, to seeing others beginning to walk with you and growing in their faith. Oh, our God, I pray that you would work this in our heart. Father, I pray that until Jesus Christ comes, I pray for this church. In this generation, Father, I pray for the young children who are up here this morning. God, I pray that they would grasp the mission. Father, I pray if anything, as parents, we would look at them and say, aren't you getting a little bit radical there? Father, I pray that, that we would think, man, they, they, are, they are really going after it. Father, I pray they would go places we have never gone. Father, I pray that their passion would stir us up. Father, I pray that the most important thing to us as parents and grandparents, as older people in this church, would that we would be shaped and molded by the gospel and we would be shaping and molding the next generation by and for the gospel. Father, I pray that in the midst of a culture that has got a thousand other priorities, we would be known as those who would say, there are people who are ashamed of it, but we are not ashamed of the gospel because it is still the power of God for salvation. And it applies to everyone, Jew and Gentile, Muslim, Buddhist, Confucian, atheist, anyone who hears and believes can be part of the people of God. Father, I pray you would fasten that to our heart. Lord, I pray for a powerful outpouring of your Holy Spirit. God, I pray here over, as we go into Advent, Lord, and we're going to be looking at the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. Father, I pray you would keep that message on our lips. Send us forth, O oh our God, right here into this mission field. Father, I pray for the area you have planted us. We have prayed for the farthest corners of the earth. Father, I pray for our Jerusalem right here in central Maryland. God, there are many who do not know you. Father, I pray you would pour your Holy Spirit out on this region. Father, I pray that many would be swept into the kingdom, that there are those who right now would have no interest in knowing you, Father, I pray in the coming weeks they would find themselves with a desire to know the living God. Father, you are able to do this. So, Lord, I pray, back where we began, Lord, I want to see more and more people here and around the world worshiping you. Father, I pray you would raise up more and more to be worshipers, and then you would send them out as laborers into your harvest. For the harvest field is ripe. God, I pray that you would do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now I encourage you to receive the blessing of God. May God be gracious to you and make his face shine upon you so that your, his ways may be known on earth his salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, our God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy. For Jesus, you rule the people justly, and you guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise our God. May all the peoples praise you. And Father, may the land yield its harvest, and may you bless us. May God bless you so all the ends of the earth will fear him. Blessed, go and be a blessing. Amen. 
Thank you for listening to the teaching ministry of Bay Ridge Christian Church. For more teachings and resources, please visit www.brcc.church.